Okay, good evening. I'm Neil Data. I'm the secretary of EPF, the European Parliamentary Forum, and I spend most of my days working with politicians on reproductive health issues. But I have a hobby, and that is to examine um, anti-choice extremist groups in my free time. I know it's not a very good hobby, but I still do that. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about the ultra-conservative counter, uh, the ultra-conservative ultra, um, ultra counter-offensive that we're seeing in Europe now. Now, what does that mean? What does, it sounds a bit scary. So I'll take us through a little bit what this means now. Now, first, we have some images from uh, different uh, countries here. So by, by the, cons uh, the ultra-conservative counter-offensive, what we're meaning is a new surge of uh, organized uh, popular actions against certain social issues. Now, this is essentially the emergence of a new social movement that we're witnessing, and it's very important to be aware of this. Now, for example, what, does it, what forms does it take? Down at the bottom, one of the first examples that we saw was in France in 2013 with the emergence of La Manif Pour Tous. This, it was a homophobic organization that emerged to protest the equal marriage law of François Hollande. So we see those uh, big uh, demonstrations in France, Closer to this country, in this region, we have um, up there the black marches in Poland against the total abortion ban. I'm sure you're familiar with that. And then closer to this neighborhood here, we have in a neighboring country um, in Romania, a referendum on um, uh, putting into the constitution a definition of marriage along uh, traditional patriarchal lines. And just here we have um, in Bulgaria, an organized campaign against the Istanbul Convention on gender-based violence. Now here, what do they have in common? We're talking about abortion on the one hand, LGBT issues on another, and then gender-based violence. So here's what we, what, where we come to. What we see now is a number of old ideas who are being strategically, or which are being strategically repackaged for a more modern day format. So what are these old ideas and what, what is this about? So we're take, what we see is that Thinkers have conceptualized uh, new ideas as a result of the social, uh, as a result of the losses that they had incurred in the 1990s with the Cairo Program of Action, which brought about international recognition for sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights, as well as the Beijing Platform of Action, which uh, uh, enshrined the uh, women's rights. They have reconceptualized uh, certain things so that now they promote human dignity, life from the moment of conception until natural death the family, traditional, patriarchal, father, mother, two children, maybe a dog, and then religious freedom, and that is the right for me, let's say I'm a Christian, to derogate from certain laws because I'm a Christian. For example, I don't have to follow hate laws, or I can object conscientiously for certain pieces of legislation. And they have been basing this on natural order, not religious doctrine. So they have secularized the arguments. Equally, they have branded progressives a certain name. Progressives are now purveyors of gender ideology. You may have heard this. Um, uh, pr uh, Prime Minister Orban in, um, in Hungary is planning to ban gender studies. Gender ide ideology, what it basically means is any social innovation of the church, that, uh, any social innovation of recent times that the church disapproves of. So divorce, family planning, abortion, equality between men and women, euthanasia even in some countries. So that's broadly what it means. It doesn't have any fixed meanings except what displeases the church. So we have this new packaging and it's being deployed throughout the region and even beyond Europe, uh, but also in the United States and Latin America. So um, what we have also is something new where it's not the old actors who are, um, who are uh, still uh, doing the same things, but we have a convergence of different actors. So now what we have is the thinking that started within the Catholic Church and Catholic thinkers, but around that have rallied the Orthodox uh, churches. For a long time, as you know, here in this country, Orthodox, the Orthodox uh, churches were relatively silent. Now they're starting to wake up and they're aligning themselves on the Catholic thinking on life, family, and religious freedom and human dignity. And to that also we can add some of the traditionalist Protestants. And here's a picture it, uh, that uh, you may recall. The 
Pope, uh, uh, Pope Francis and uh, Patriarch Kirill met in Cuba, the first meeting of the two heads of church in over a thousand years, and what did they talk about? They talked about their common enemy of gender ideology, and that was the main thing that brought them together. What we're seeing also is a revamped, uh, a revamped infrastructure to deal with this. So um, in many countries in Europe, there have always been um, anti-choice, anti-abortion organizations. They were often called pro-life, pro-vita, this or that, uh, depending on the countries. But we're seeing that with their new expanded mandate on life, family, and religious freedom, they've also, they've also stepped up uh, their game. We see two main trends. One is professionalization, and another one is transnational organization. In terms of how they have professionalized, we see political advocacy, okay, that's normal, they're playing the same game as all of us are. Uh, the Irish colleague was talking about working with members of parliament, they're now doing exactly the same thing. Uh, what we see is that they have leapfrogged the progressive movement in social media organization, so that now they are able to generate petitions, etc. They have a community, an online community of over 9 million people where they, they are able to put pressure on international institutions such as the UN, the European Parliament, the Council of Europe, on these types of issues. They are also specialists of fake news. It's now a household uh, word uh, that we, we're all uh, uh, familiar with. Fake news, in fact, started with the anti-choice movement in terms of these, uh, what we heard from the previous speaker, um, abortion causes breast cancer and things like this. Um, use of participatory uh, uh, democracy tools the use of petitions to provoke referenda on, so, on certain uh, social issues, such as in Romania on, equal, on uh, traditional marriage, Croatia on, tradi on traditional marriage, in uh, Portugal or Finland on abortion and conscientious objection in abortion. So we see this type of thing. And most importantly, litigation. The, uh, there's a whole spate of new lawyers that are appearing which will aim to litigate issues of abortion and uh, related life, family, and religious freedom issues in European courts. We also see that they have organized transnationally. Some of the most important uh, networks that we see are uh, Agenda Europe, a uh, gathering that takes place every year, which brings together about 200 people from 30 countries around Europe that discuss and strategize these issues. We've also seen that these issues also have entered politics and have even become a geopolitical issue uh, within uh, the politics of the continent. So here, in, in terms of uh, politics, what we see is a convergence of what had been three previously unconnected movements. Um, one, there have always been the religious actors. Secondly, um, there had always been the far-right actors. Every country, just about every country, country in Europe has some tradition of having a far-right group or party in its, own, uh, in its own system. And third, we see a relatively new phenomenon, and that is the, of the populists. Now, each of these three movements have in some ways found each other, are able to benefit from interacting with the other two movements, so that now we have a fusion of them, so as to bring about um, uh, an anti-choice, anti-women's rights perspective to a very high level. And so that's why you have these four lovely gentlemen there. You can see a combination of far-right populism and religious ideology in all four of them, Mr. Orban, Putin, Kaczynski, and Matteo Salvini in Italy. And this is something happening across the continent and even beyond the shores of, uh, of Europe. We see this happening also in the United States, Canada, and Latin America. We also see that, the, that our issues, progressive uh, sexual reproductive health issues, are becoming a major issue in geopolitics. So that um, the European Union uh, is seen as progressive, even degenerate, and um, promoting what, according to Mr. Putin, would be a gay Europa or a, Euro a Eurosodom. On the other hand, <laughs> Russia positions itself as the champion of a Christian Europe. And then in between this, you have the Vatican and the United States also pulling in different directions. The Vatican has always been pulling towards a more Christian version, Christian Catholic version of Europe, um, and the United States can go on either direction depending on who's in the White House. Um, now, these movements, when we think about them, one reaction I always get is, oh, they're very well funded. Uh, you know, they have more money than we do. 
I'm not that, that sure that they have more money than we do, but one thing is for sure, funding has become a battleground in and of itself. Now, if we, whether they have more money or not, uh, uh, there's no way of proving that, but one thing is clear, the ultra-conservatives have studied the progressives and have devised a strategy or a set of strategies to strip progressives of their funding. So that we see this most clearly in the United States with the campaign to defund Planned Parenthood. And we see this being exported and then domesticated into different national contexts in a manner that's appropriate in that, ma in that way. So that, for example, in Spain, the Planned Parenthood affiliate of Spain has lost its public utility status and therefore it no longer qualifies for state funding from the Spanish authorities. Um, at European level, there was also an attempt entitled One of Us to block any EU funding involved with the destruction of the human embryo. And uh, so this means maternal health in, de in developing countries and stem cell research. They were able to use one of these participatory demo democracy instruments, a, a European citizens initiative, and they got over 1.7 million signatures. It didn't work in the end, but still, this is proof of their capacity and what they're thinking of. And as I'm sure you've seen um, in this region, but also everywhere, um, the demonization of George Soros and of anyone who touches money from the Soros-affiliated uh, foundations. On my trip down here uh, yesterday, I was reading the newspapers, and I was reading a little bit about the Kavanaugh hearings in the United States. And one thing that struck me was um, an article that was the five myths about, uh, about Miss Ford, the woman who's accusing Kavanaugh of uh, sexual misconduct. They're mis-circulating fake news about her. Three of the myths about her is that one, she was a Soros grantee. Secondly, there's a fake picture of her with George Soros. And third, uh, that she secretly works for a pharmaceutical company that makes abortion pills. And therefore, she, her testimony is not credible. So this is the level that this type of stuff has entered into politics in the United States, and, but also here in Europe. So what is the end objective of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'll go back. Um, yeah. So that's one thing that they've done with, uh, with the, their strategy for defunding us. What do we know about their funding? One thing we know is that they're funded by the US Christian right. There is increasing evidence that Russia and Russian oligarchs are also involved in funding this agenda. And then third, one thing that is interesting is that we find that there's billionaires here in Europe funding this. But what's interesting is to take a look at what are the other things that these billionaires are funding. And for example, there's one that we know funds this agenda. He also funds climate change denying think tanks and also a pro-Brexit think tank. Now, what do these things have in common? They have in common a deregulation small state agenda to strip the state, the government, of any powers to make laws. So we have this type of ideology funding this agenda. So what is the end objective of, uh, of uh, these ultra-conservatives? There's many who think that we could be heading toward a handmaid's tale type of scenario if they get their way. I'm rather doubtful about this because I think that the end objective is much more subtle and, uh, in fact, nuanced and complex. I think what they're going for is a small state, the government does very little, and you let hyper-free market capitalism reign. This will benefit rich people. Uh, you then have um, a social organization based on the church, based on whatever church is the most important in your country, that's the basis of social organization. You then have a mutually legitimizing role between the church and the state. The small state and the big church mutually legitimize each other to keep the other one in power. Take a look at what's happening in Russia and uh, Putin and the, and the patriarch and you see the perfect relationship uh, uh, taking place there. So that very likely the scenario that would be ideal according to this worldview is not so much the handmaid's tale but it's, it looks a lot more like the dictatorships and authoritarian regimes of Latin America of the 1970s and 80s. And so it's lessons from there that we need to learn from. So I'll end on this, what can we do? So first of all, we need to recognize the pattern, the toolkit, the actors, and that also the realization that no country is spared from this. A very good example of this is Bulgaria. 
for many years the Bulgarian colleagues were saying, this issue is not important for us, we have no problem, there's no pro-life anti-choice organization in this country. And then they started the process of ratifying the Istanbul Convention on Gender-Based Violence. Now, who could be against uh, this type of convention? But all of a sudden, because there's the word gender there, and it would recognize the fact that women and men are equal, not simply complementary, a huge campaign appeared out of nowhere. The Bulgarian colleagues were caught completely unprepared and unaware, and they lost the ratification of the Istanbul Convention. So that no country is spared. We need to be proactive in denouncing these, uh, these ultra-conservative fundamentalist groups for what they are. The Croatian colleagues have done an excellent job so that while they are there present in the country, they are cordoned off from, uh, from actual political power. And that's as a result of the great work that they've done. And then also, perhaps, and I'll end on this, is to first of all recognize that progress is not in inevitable. All of us, we've lived through a wonderful or a very interesting 20, 30 years where uh, we thought that progress would simply happen. We just need to, to wait time. It would take some effort, but basically we're all going in the same direction. And uh, in terms of sexual reproductive health and rights, that, you know, Ireland is a good case. Hopefully Poland will be next. Um, that's not necessarily going to happen that way. We now have, we have our own progressive agenda to move ahead, to move forward on, but we need to uh, org understand that there's a modern, newly organized and freshly, um, uh, freshly organized movement that is working to block our progress and also roll back the progresses that we have historically gained. So that's something that we need to be aware of. And uh, at least being aware of that means that we can at least anticipate the battles that will be coming ahead. So thank you very much for your time.